Hey there, Mr. Jason. How you doing today? Doing good. How are you, Charlene? Yeah, you know, I'm doing good, but I have a confession just before we get started here. Just got back from out of town, slept for 11 hours last night. It was a big road trip. And today, I do feel like a new person, but I didn't fix the hair. Is this going to be okay with you? I have no comments about hair. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. All right. Awesome. So today we're going to be talking about cryptocurrencies and NFTs. And I'm really excited about this because our approach is going to be that you're actually going to educate me from scratch on both. And I would like to start with crypto because I actually already have some crypto investment. It's very modest. Um, and I'll tell you what I did and then what I have now. And, and we'll start there because I don't really even know what I'm doing there. Then we'll go to NFTs. Sound fair? Perfect. All right. So crypto. Uh-oh. You can probably hear the noon bell. Uh, let me see here. Is that too loud for you? No, I can hear it, but it's not too loud. Okay. That'll only go off once. Small town. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So for cryptocurrency, what I did, I think it was about three years ago now, I put 100 US dollars into Coinbase and signed up for that. And over the last three years, I went from $100 down to $70 down to $20. At one point it got down to like $5. I was like, well, that was a great investment. Then it creeps back up again. And now it's just under 400 bucks. And it's just kind of, it's a little wild. And it seems like some years it goes way, way down. And some years it jumps up for like a second and then goes down again. So that's my experience with crypto. When I remember to log into Coinbase, which is like once every four months, <laughs> that's the pattern I'm seeing. So what's up with crypto? What is a cryptocurrency? Why is mine doing that? And tell me everything I need to know about, about it. <laughs> yes. So cryptos <laughs> encompass all the cryptocurrencies that are out there right now. Bitcoin, Ethereum, Dogecoin, all the other stuff that's out there. Right. Um, a cryptocurrency is a tokenized asset that's hosted on the blockchain. And I'll explain. I'll have to explain what that yeah, is I have uh, to in a second. Camera, but I still will be here. My bandwidth today is iffy. Okay. But I'm okay cool. Okay. Um, so we uh, are... Uh, a cryptocurrency is a tokenized asset that somebody can use to buy and sell stuff. It's number for, another form of currency. Um, the whole promise of cryptocurrency, though, is that it's not controlled by any federal governments or any federal reserves worldwide. So, <clears throat> excuse me. That's why people like the allure, or at least in part, that's why people like the allure of cryptocurrencies because it's not controlled. It's decentralized. Ah, okay. So it's not controlled, it's decentralized, it's a digital asset, but is it money? Anything can be money. Um, as long as it's agreed upon, upon by enough people, trading cards can be money. Back in the day, um, beads and gems were money, gold, silver, uh, US dollars, euros, uh, Chinese yuan. Anything can be money if enough people agree to it. So yes, it is a form of money. Um, okay. Well, I need to interrupt for one thing though, because you said anything can be money if enough people agree to it. Now it seems to me like not a lot of people are agreeing that cryptocurrency is money right now. So is it money yet? It is, and that's changing rapidly. So I first heard about Bitcoin probably 2013, 2014 time frame when I was working on an investment newsletter. And the uh, guy I was working with, the guy who hired me, he was talking to me about this cryptocurrency and the Bitcoin and how he bought Bitcoin and was going up a ton. And I was like, oh, I just, I just didn't understand it um, at that point. And that was a mistake on my part um, because I didn't invest in it because I didn't understand it. But having said that, you should understand cryptos to a degree if you're going to invest in them. Not every single nuance, not everything about the blockchain, not everything about decentralized finance, all the stuff we're gonna probably talk about today, but you should at least understand the basics. It can be used as money. That's rapidly changing. Um, companies like, um, to illustrate that, companies like, this is for another investment newsletter, companies like Visa, MasterCard, American Express um, are allowing cryptocurrency transactions now on many of their cards. Um, they're partnering with uh, platforms, various platforms to do this. And so if you have, let's say, 100 uh, Bitcoin or $100 worth of Bitcoin. Right. Hi, puppy. 
<laughs> in in your on your crypto backed uh, Visa card, for example, you can use that to buy stuff. Now, to your point, it's pretty limited up to this point. That is changing rapidly. You can now I just read it like last week for another investment site I write for that Visa. It was Visa and Mastercard were partnering with various companies, including big ones like Apple and Amazon, to allow Visa and Mastercard backed cryptocurrency cards. Sorry, that's a mouthful. That's okay. To allow purchases on their platforms <laughs> at some to be determined time. It's starting to happen now, but it's not happening in mass yet. Okay, so I have so many questions now. First is that if I get a card like that and I can use my crypto, I'm not sure would it be smart for me to do so because the problem that I'm seeing with my cryptocurrency is that on any given day, it could be worth an actual dollar or it could be worth less than a dollar. I don't exactly know what I'm going to be paying for. I'm sorry. I don't know the amount I'm going to be paying. Yeah. How to equate it to the U.S. dollar. Do you know why I can't figure that out? Is that a murky question? That may be murky. No, uh, you can't figure that out because the price of, for example, Bitcoin, it changes every day. It goes up and down every day, just like the U.S. dollar currency does. But the U.S. dollar currency for us Americans doesn't really change in value on a day-to-day -day basis. One dollar yesterday will still get us a dollar worth of stuff today, barring things like inflation and price rises and stuff like that. However, if you go to Europe, for example, from the US, me and my wife went to Spain a couple years ago, the exchange rate was not good. Uh, no, it was pretty good at that point in Spain. So we were able to buy more than we would have been able to with our US dollars exchanged into euros than we would have been, in, let's say, like five years ago when the euro was up here and the US dollar was down here. Does that make sense? Yes. Same thing happens. Same thing happens with cryptocurrencies. So it's not that cryptocurrencies are unique in the going up and down in the value. I think no. what I'm hearing from you, though, is it's unique that it's going so extremely up and down. It's so volatile right now. Yes. And I will say the value and the price are two different things. The price is what's kind of going up and down kind of crazy. The value doesn't really change much over time. Um, or it does slowly, but the price goes up and down crazy. That's, that's what you're referring to. Um, yes, that is relatively new. So throughout history, we've had, again, different currencies that have kind of ruled the world, been world reserve currencies, what they're called. They have gone up and down in value, just like they all do all the time but the sky high fluctuations from what was bitcoin worth like five six years ago 100 bucks yeah. for bitcoin now it's 20 30 40 50 60 thousand that has not happened that kind of skyrocketing I, to my knowledge has not happened okay and i was confused i'm glad you clarified that because i absolutely was confusing the price of bitcoin with the value of bitcoin i didn't know there was a difference until just now yes so first lesson learned okay value of bitcoin and price of bitcoin are two different things Yes. And slightly side note, just to see if I understand this correctly. Is it the same for gold? The price of gold versus the value of gold? This is the same for everything. For everything. This is the same okay. for stocks. This is the same for private businesses. This is the same thing for commercial real estate. This is the same thing for a pair of jeans. Huh. Okay. Um, I used to buy and sell stuff or buy stuff at thrift stores and um, sell them on places like eBay and Amazon. Right. I found... It was a Giorgio Armani, like a brand new pair of Giorgio Armani pants one time that I bought for, I think, $2. So that right. was the price I paid, right? Uh -huh. But I sold it on Amazon or on eBay for, I think it was $80 or $100. So that was the value somebody perceived that they wanted to get out of that nice transaction. Turnaround. Okay. So right. when we talk about price and value, it's different for everything we're dealing with. So okay. again- Water. I have water in this cup right here. This one, me and my wife and our friends went to Mexico. I have some water. Water right now is worth, what, cents in the U.S.? Yeah. But if I'm in a desert and I need it, what would I be willing to pay to get a this jug of water? Jason, I kind of feel like the an value. idiot. I honestly never parsed this out before. Don't feel like an idiot. Yeah. Anybody watching this, don't feel like an idiot. Um, because... Most people, even in the investment realm, don't realize price and value are two completely separate things. Yeah. They just see, for example, the stock price going up and they think the value of the company is going up. Some cases that's true, 
most cases it's not most most uh times especially right now for example what's going on right now in the stock market prices are going up when value like pretty much straight up but there we go <laughs> backwards again ah. but the values of the companies are going up only slightly got it all right thank you for that that's cheap that locked in a lot of foundations for me that I was missing before. So I'm glad to know that. Perfect. Okay. So we have that. So now to build on that foundation, let's talk about decentralized banking. I yes. think that is what cryptocurrencies are promising. What does that mean? What does that mean in a real world sense mm -hmm. is the idea behind decentralized finance, decentralized banking is to put more power in the hands of you and I, people out there who want to take, who want to have more control over our finances, over our savings, over our transactions, over all that. This has come about in the last, really the last about five years and it's accelerating now. Why? Because the internet, the internet is the probably the best example of decentralized anything ever. It's not run by one, any one, government it's not run by any one company it's not controlled by anything true so the idea is with the power of the internet to give us more power um put more power in our hands and take it away from places like the big banks for example that's the theory <laughs> <laughs> that's the theory okay yes so what that means then for somebody like me is I could look at my I'm bank sorry, account. I have to get my dog. She wants up on the bed. <laughs> Not a problem. <laughs> and actually, while we're taking a mile break here, welcome to the live stream. If anybody's on this stream, I can't see right now uh, due to some technical limitations. But actually, do we have anyone yet? Um, yes, we have people on. I don't see Let's any comments. We are comments. checking the comments. All right. If you have any comments, questions, anything you want us to talk about, let us know. And I am watching the comments today, although we are having problems with Facebook comments, just to let you know, um, we can't see them most of the time for some reason. We don't know why, we can't figure out why. Um, so if you're watching on the best place, if you want to comment is probably go to YouTube yeah. um, because let's we can see the comments on YouTube. Yeah, and let's explain the camera for a moment. I It's not allowing me to go back on camera. We're gonna carry on because what we're gonna do is anyone that's seeing this live will also get the recording. Anybody who's not also will get the recording. The recording will be edited. So we'll see Jason anyway as the teacher here. I am less important. Jason is the knowledge here. So we definitely want to make sure he can be on camera. <laughs> All right. So we've got decentralized banking now, or at least in theory. So for somebody like me, I think what this means, and tell me if I'm wrong, is that I can look at my bank, I can look at my business account, and I can look at my personal account, and I can see, okay, they're going to charge me X fee for doing a thing. Uh, so I can say, do I want to pay that fee? Or I can say, do I want to put it in Bitcoin and get around that fee? Is that what, is that what that means for me? Sort of. So if you trade in and out of Bitcoin, for example, or you, uh, here's actually a real world example. Those, those Visa and, um, Visa and MasterCard Bitcoin or cryptocurrency backed credit cards I was talking about. Right. You still have to pay a fee on those. Okay. Those fees don't go to necessarily the banks, the big banks, but they go to, I think it's like a 2% fee on visas. Um, MasterCards are about the same. And then American Express has a slightly higher swipe fee. It's called a swipe fee. Um, you still have to pay those fees. So it's not a way to get out of fees per se. Um, that's, that's not part of the promise. The main promise is along with the decentralized part and putting more power in our hands is that it would be backed by the blockchain, which the blockchain, I'm not going to get super nerdy. Oh, we're going to get into that in a minute. Cause I actually oh, okay. heard about that as well. We'll get into there. We're going to dive into that. Okay, perfect. I'll just do the short example yep. here. So the blockchain will essentially be able to track and encrypt every single transaction that you make. So again, let's say you have water. Uh, and I want to sell this to Charlene. If this was encoded on the blockchain, it would notice that transaction and keep a ledger of that transaction. That I learned this uh, phrasing from one of the investment newsletter, newsletters I used to write for. It would keep cr track of that transaction on the ledger. So no matter how many times it's transacted, 
you will be able to keep a record of that. Why is that important? Because then that can help you eliminate fraud. It can help you find out if you've been stolen from, who stole it from you. Um, again, that's the theory of the blockchain. Okay. And while we're on this, so I will reiterate that with a simplistic statement. What you're, what you just said there, was, in theory, with cryptocurrencies, transactions will be a lot more secure, because we can actually track the entire life of the product uh, that's tied to that transaction. Correct. That's Correct. what you're saying. Okay. Correct. All right. Now let's talk about blockchain in general and what that is. Now that um, I'm going to ask you first. I know I know a lot about that because it actually goes into my wheel house, which was the tech stuff that I used to do. So what is blockchain exactly? Go deeper into it. We already talked about why it's important, but let's talk about the nitty gritty. Let's first talk about blockchain. I'll ask you questions one by one. Okay. What is blockchain in depth? Okay. So we already talked about like what it is in theory, what it's going to do blockchain. This is where things get exciting for me is because cryptocurrencies are they're cool. They're all that stuff. Um, hey, Deb, thanks hey, for Deb. watching. Thanks for commenting on. She said, "Now I'm on YouTube." Yay! <laughs> she must have heard my comment about getting on YouTube. Good so, of you to join us, Deb. Yeah, and, thanks for watching, Deb. And Jason, before you carry on, you just said it because I'm going to call bullshit on that last statement. You said cryptocurrencies are cool, yeah, but actually, from what I've seen from you, you're not that excited about cryptocurrencies. You're more excited about the technology. Is that true? Yes, and that's okay. what we're getting to in the blockchain. Yeah. So again, when I said cryptocurrencies are cool, the idea is cool. I'm not huge on cryptocurrencies, and we'll get into that probably later. But what I am big on is blockchain. I think blockchain is going to transform pretty much everything we do. Um, how? Because, because it can track, again, this water. Let's say um, parts of the western U.S. need water because they're having a severe drought like in California. This happens pretty much what once every three to five years, something like that. Right. Um, Charlene, in the US, let's say they need a massive influx of water. Water at that point becomes more valuable. So it might be ripped off. Right. So if there's a transport of water, again, yes, I know water is not a great example because it's very heavy. It's hard to transport. The economics aren't great. Just go with me on this. I like it. <laughs> but Let's say you have a huge uh, transport fleet of vehicles transporting water from, let's say, where I live in Florida to California. It's ultra valuable. It's um, going to a place that needs it, so they want to be able to track it. If before or now, if that gets lost, let's say, in Texas, there's no way to really track what happened with the water. Right. Who had um, it last? Who, yeah, who had it last? Who yeah. exactly who had it last? Exactly what time they had it? This, yep. this is how in depth the blockchain, again, is in theory. Exactly who had it last, exactly where its last known location was, exact details of pretty much everything. Right. Right now, if somebody were to steal that water, you couldn't figure out probably who it was unless there was some kind of massive water exchange <laughs> somewhere <laughs> black market water, water exchange <laughs> um but with blockchain you could track that um exactly where it was so for example if the driver was the last person known on the blockchain to have it you would probably go ask him first what happened to this massive shipment of water did it get lost did they get in a car wreck did they steal did somebody steal it what happened that is but blockchains are being built out not just for agricultural examples and when i say agricultural examples like from the farm to the transportation or to the processing to the transportation to the to the um, stores to your home right blockchains are being built out for everything right now um financial transactions for for uh, mortgages, things like mortgages and any kind, any kind of contracts, any kind of contractual agreements. So let's say, Charlene, I were to hire you tomorrow and we signed a contract, that could be hosted on the blockchain. So in theory, it would make things easier to facilitate and make uh, it, there would be less fees because there would be less headaches for both of us. We wouldn't have to deal with lawyers because it would be kind of right there, um, especially if it was vetted, if the contract was vetted by a lawyer first. Um, one of the key yeah, things here about this part is that blockchain technology, this tracking of transactions, 
yes. is tracking the item or service itself, but it doesn't necessarily have to be tied to personal identity. Because yes. Bitcoins are all not tied to identity. I either have it or I don't. Yes. So it comes down literally to computer language, zeros and ones. This is why it is infallible in theory, because it can't be hacked. I mean, it can't be changed. I mean, this is this is a literal step by step permanent stamp on the transaction of that item or service. Is that correct? Correct. But why do we keep saying in theory, people might be wondering. Right. I was going to go there next. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's before we go to the why in theory, because uh, I want to do this. This will, I think, concrete the example. Let's use a vehicle as an example. You know, we yeah. have things like CarMax and we have vehicle titles and things, you know, because if we can buy it from CarMax, we can get the title on it. Uh, say that vehicle was in an accident. Well, that's easy to track now because due to blockchain chain technology, we can see the life, the transaction of that vehicle and then track it with what we know as humans to put the pieces together. However, yes. because it is not necessarily tied to identity, no one in theory can lie about the history of that vehicle because the transactions tell the truth no matter what. Yes. So correct. now with the vehicle example, why do we keep saying in theory? Because here's one of my rules in finance that I kind of learned. I don't remember where I learned this from, but if anybody says anything is always true, never true or impossible. They're all you absolutes. Need to, yes, the, <laughs> the absolutes in anything, you need to be very careful. Because with blockchain, the theory is and was that it's impossible to hack. I just last week, maybe two weeks ago now, saw an article, article where six hundred forty million dollars Bitcoin was stolen out of somebody's, out of a banking bank or something. I can't remember what it was, and they can't figure out who took it. <laughs> right, because it's not tied to identity. <laughs> yeah, because it's not tied to, to identity. So <laughs> there are gives and takes here. The the main promise of blockchain is that it will eliminate most fraud. Yeah. Most of these issues, it in theory will eliminate because it's hard, because it's encrypted, because it's harder to track or get a hold of, all that stuff. Nothing will ever fix this problem permanently. Yeah. But um, it still does need to be tied then back to yes. human common sense in our existing business processes in order to double back it, so to speak. Yes, exactly. Right? Yeah. yeah, have records, have duplicates, have uh, redundancies, all that stuff, yes. So if anything, I would trust a transaction more if somebody said to me, let's use blockchain chain technology for this, for a lot of our tracking. I would actually trust that more because I'd say, okay, we're gonna use that, then we're gonna use our processes, we're gonna get lawyers involved, we're gonna do our contracts. That to me does solve the majority of the fraud that we're exposed to now. Yes, yes. And that's frankly, that's one of the big promises of blockchain is to eliminate fraud. Why is that important? Not just on the front level. I've had my identity stolen twice. Oh, yeah. That's a nightmare of a process to figure uh, out. Huh? Um, but it could stop in theory. Again, it could stop that kind of stuff. So the person who stole my identity, they would be far easier to track and it would be far harder to get a hold of the information in the first place. Again, why is that important? Not only because it eliminates the headaches from the millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people every year who have to deal with some kind of online or internet fraud or um, identity fraud or whatever, all the frauds out there that are perpetrated online. It'll eliminate, I've seen estimates between 70 and 90% of those kind of frauds, which will save us all an enormous amount of time. For these businesses and for business owners, it will also save an enormous amount of money as well. Um, how. how will they save money? Yeah. How? Yeah. If you can eliminate 70 to 90% of fraud, companies like, for example, I think it was American Express had spent like $10 billion a year to secure their stuff. Yeah. If they only have to say spend one or 2 billion on that, that's 8 billion more dollars. They can reinvest in the company, pay dividends, do to, uh, do whatever they want. Which is so great. Will, Anytime a company yeah. can do that, we want them to reinvest in the business. That is a great thing to happen. Well, then that means they can hire more people. They can reinvest in the business, pay dividends, do whatever they want with the money. That money isn't wasted, essentially, on trying to prevent fraud. Right. It's actually reinvested at a higher rate of return. Um, so it's more of a um, – it's more proactive than reactive is probably how I'd put it. So overall, it's smart – based on what you're saying, it's really smart for all businesses, at least most of them that I can think of, 
to have a look at blockchain, to see, you know, talk to somebody like you, or maybe an, even an expert in blockchain. I know that's not exactly what you focus on, but you know a lot about yeah. it. And yeah. look at the options here to see how can they cut their costs. Because if they can cut their costs, it might make the difference between barely staying afloat to we're in the green now. I mean, it could make yeah. a big difference for these guys. Oh yeah, no. Over time, I think this again. I think blockchain is going to transform the world and how we transact, and specifically how we transact things. Yeah. And again, the more efficiency there is in any process, but specifically the more efficiency there is in this process in transacting transacting anything. Right. The more money companies make, which means all the other stuff we just led to, that could also mean in not just in theory this has happened throughout history the more efficiencies there generally are in an industry the lower prices go as well so it could help consumers uh, could help all of us as consumers as well i love it i have two next questions before i get into them let's check for uh any comments are we hearing from anybody i don't we are see live, any you guys. on anybody would like to YouTube. jump in and ask anything you want put any comment in there you want we will periodically check this is a very interactive conversation yeah. Okay, and perfect. again, I, I'm not seeing any comments on Facebook, guys, but if you are, we can't see the comments on Facebook sometimes. Sometimes we can, sometimes we can't. We don't know why. Um, so if you want to ask something or comment on something, make sure to check out the YouTube stream as well. Well, while we're at it, I hate to keep digging on Facebook, but I do want to make this clear. Not only can we not see comments on Facebook, but Jason and I have been talking about Facebook as a viable platform in general. And right now, it's still a conversation in progress because one of the other issues that we're having is Facebook will not allow us to post a link to his masterclass that explains everything he knows about finances. They say that it's actually against community standards. Now, we have reached out. We've spoken with Facebook several times. They're not easy to get a hold of. And even then, it's really difficult to have a conversation with a live human. So they simply just keep saying we're fraudy. We are not. We don't know why we're blocked. Yeah. So that is why Facebook is limited to us overall. I hope that makes yes. sense. Yes. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought that up because, yeah, we've been trying to share links with you guys. We can't share any of our links. I even had one of um, uh, past Masterclass students try to share a link with me on something he was trying to get help with, and he couldn't share it from his platform. So yeah. we did something we have, at some point, or we've been blocked for some unwritten no reason at some point. We're trying to figure it out, but at this point, we're not putting much faith in Facebook, unfortunately, yeah. because we have other customer options. service yep. we is have other not options. We'll go down those roads. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So here's the next question. It's going to tie into the one right after that. So the next question is, how do we tie? Let's just make sure we reiterate what blockchain technology is and why important that tracking is with cryptocurrency. So here's my rudimentary understanding. <coughs> cryptocurrency itself is the item that is being tracked. It's the money that's being tracked using blockchain technology so jason if i want to sell you some of my bitcoin i can sell it to you and that transaction will forever be there it will know that it went from me to you well my number to your number since it's not tied to our identity yeah. now when we look at cash and coins that's not trackable you know once that gets out into the economy we have no idea who has that one dollar or a hundred dollar bill we never can track it so this is interesting because we can not only reduce a lot of the fraud but having that trackable ability really means that the person that's buying this stuff has more buying power and insights over to the history of that cryptocurrency. Is that correct? That is correct. So let's use your vehicle example. Yep. Let's say not only did the car, you, you're wondering if it got in a wreck. What if you're buying a car from somebody down the street and you don't know if they actually own the car? Yeah, there you With go. With blockchain, you would know you could see this person's name matches up. Well, not this person's name. Well, but using our you, processes, but yes. Yeah, <laughs> using the processes, you'd be able to match up. Is this the rightful owner of the car or is this stolen stuff? Right. Um, and again, stolen stuff could be boats, could be boat motors. I live in Tampa where there's a lot of boating. You mm. see everyone small about boats or motors getting stolen. If those have firearms. chips in them. It's a big one. Yeah, firearms. Yep. If these have chips in them with which is coming with the internet of things, no matter whether you like it or not, it's coming. Right. There will soon be yep. microchips and everything. Um, you'll be able to track who had that last, all that stuff. And you'll be able to know, is this a legally obtainable item or is this stolen? And eventually it'll probably be even things like biometrics and hand encoded stuff, <laughs> things like on firearms and all that stuff. But that's a different story because that's, that's more futuristic. <laughs> That makes sense, though. I mean, I do feel like that is the direction eventually, you know, yeah. that we're all heading. Now, let's talk about cryptocurrency. 
Uh, let's talk about what it got my attention, why it got my attention. I was reading at the time about countries overseas losing their uh, their money, their existing money, and their economy collapsed. We've seen it mm -hmm. happen in Greece a couple of times. I think we've seen it in Egypt. Um, actually, we've seen it in a lot of countries over there where mm -hmm. people, once they have that situation, now their money, whatever that is, their currency is worthless. But if they have cryptocurrency, it's unaffected by that. As long as that cryptocurrency is accepted by the vendors that they still want to do business with. Is that correct? That is correct. But that gets us to a problem okay, that we talked we about as long as it's accepted by yep. enough people. Yeah. That is becoming truer every day. Bitcoin, all, all cryptocurrencies are being accepted more places, more merchants everywhere. However, certain countries typically do not like this stuff. For example, China, and India have both banned, I think not, maybe not all cryptocurrencies, but at least Bitcoin, stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, it sounds like a crypto police state masquerading as a security. That is, I mean, yeah. it, that's from critical thinking. It, it could be, yes, it could be. Um, and again, the microchips, I know that that scares a lot of people. And frankly, I don't necessarily agree with it, but it's coming. There's nothing we can do to stop that Who from that happening. Comment? Uh, critical thinking on YouTube asked that. I like it. I like that critical thinking. I do, and yeah, no, that that's a great yep. point because yep. again, um, I, I don't know if I don't know if you've seen the movie Minority Report here in the U.S. Uh, with Tom Cruise back in the day. It's a great movie. It was. I really like that movie too. Uh, but there's a lot of scary stuff in there, um, <laughs> and a lot of that stuff is coming true to a degree in various different forms. For example, in that movie you had the eye the eye scan right. to get into the building or whatever towards the end of the movie that's happening i mean you can do that with your iphone now oh we have biometrics <laughs> now yeah, yeah exactly. biometrics is here already and it's going to get even more um prominent as we go again whether that's right or wrong good or bad it's that's just what's happening it's it's going to happen well, we're, we're gonna we're about to dive into the more negative side the paranoia side maybe it's paranoia maybe yeah. it's not. We're gonna dive into some of the, some of the fears around it, and then come back around to positive points. The reason I want to touch on all of these things is because if somebody like me is looking at investing in cryptocurrencies, they should be aware of everything. Um, yeah. And some of the fear, in my opinion, is simply that it's simply fear; it's not uh, fact based. But some of the concern is valid. <laughs> so we yeah, have to be aware, you know. Well, and to get back to the the China and India. Yes, thing, let's go back to that. This is one reason I haven't invested in Bitcoin or any cryptocurrencies at this point because I've studied history. I know that governments when they when their when their currency comes under stress, they do everything they can to fight against that because their currency gives them power over their government, taxes, the people, all that stuff. Yes, yeah, literally what makes their country run. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, for, uh, for example, before we get back to China and India, the U.S. dollar hasn't always been around. Back in, I think, the Civil War ruined the greenback was the currency at the time because the U.S. Um, spent so much money and was so much debt after the Civil, U.S. Civil War. They had to create a new currency because the greenback defaulted. Uh, I don't know if it was a technical default like some of these other countries we're going to talk about um, but I do know they had to get rid of that currency and they implemented the U.S. dollar years later to take the place of it because the currency came under too much stress. How does that relate to China and India? They have outlawed to some degree, and I think India banned all cryptocurrencies, banned them. You can't transact in these things. Well, again, that's what that, they say. Yeah, there's that's what they around. say. Yeah, there's <laughs> ways around that. Yeah. And again, is that right or wrong? I don't think it's right, but <laughs> but it is what um, it is. It is what it is. And again, I expected that because of the history I've studied. Uh, are more countries going to do that? Probably, frankly, um, because they don't control it. If they, if the U.S. government, for example, they don't directly control U.S. money supply because the Federal Reserve does. It's an independent entity, which it's not. But yeah. they say they are. Sure. Which means they can print as much money as they want and do these things that they've been doing during the 2007, 2008 financial crisis and during the COVID crash. They can print money. Bad. They can buy bonds. Late. They can, yeah, they can do all that stuff. It, they can't do that with Bitcoin because they don't control it. Right. Um, 
that's why until that is more situated to me, that means Bitcoin and the other cryptocurrencies are more of a speculation. Again, technology is fantastic. I'm fascinated by the technology. But until it becomes widely accepted, literally pretty much everywhere, then if you have a million dollars, for example, in Bitcoin, but you go to India, but you don't have any other cash, probably can't do anything. <laughs> right. All right. So let me ask you this. You're a business owner. You just said that Bitcoin is not really viable until it gets more widely accepted anywhere. Why aren't you accepting Bitcoin then? If you wanted to get accepted anywhere, you have the option to throw your hat in the ring and say, I accept this. So how come you're not doing that? So with the payment processors I use, Stripe and PayPal, I don't think I have the option to accept cryptocurrencies at this point. Okay. Um, okay. I don't think I do. If there's an option out there that somebody knows, of, let me know. And I would if there's it. an option, would you? Is or do you have any other uh, um, objections to to accepting it? No, I don't. Because um, to me, uh, I'll get to your comment in a, in a uh, second. Critical thinking, because that's a great comment. Um, to me, I don't care as long as I can exchange it to, for example, U.S. dollars, because yeah. that's what I transaction. I don't. I don't care. Um, so I wouldn't have any. I wouldn't have any qualms against that. Okay, critical thinking said technically all of today's fiat currency is crypto. However, the only difference is you can physically possess it, making it seem real. It's all debt. 100% agree. Nice. The money out there that is money is not real money. It's not backed by anything. It hasn't been since, since the 70s. Uh, probably never will be again, frankly. Um, no, I 100% agree. But that is the US uh, dollar it is the world's reserve currency and that is what is accepted at most places worldwide even outside the u.s um it's accepted at many places worldwide and even when it's not like directly like let's say when i go to merchant in, in europe they only accept euros you can exchange the euros or the u.s dollars into euros either there or at an atm or at a currency exchange thing you can't do that with bitcoin right now um so again until that changes even though i 100 percent would agree with you um that yeah that's right. I mean, we also had yeah, another comment I, in there did we i thought we did i don't think so i'm not I seeing one more. i wish i could see these yeah i wish i could see them too it's driving me especially the facebook stuff it drives me insane right. um we'll carry on if i not. don't think so if yeah i don't see anyone, one come over to youtube for now so that we can chat with you yes please yeah if, if we if you have a comment we're having some issues with facebook we'd love to interact with you we can on Facebook. We can't see the comments for some reason. Um, so come over to the YouTube channel. Yeah. And now, crit critical theory has got some good thoughts there. And I also love that name, critical theory. <laughs> yes. Uh, leading to critical thinking, which I know this is a little bit of a bitter statement, but I wish we could see more of that lately. <laughs> more critical thinking skills. So, yes. All right. So we have now, you're saying that the U.S. government is not going to adopt this yet because they cannot control it. Let me back you up a little. Are you here? I see you yes. looking at something. Okay. So um, I'm I'm posting the YouTube link in the uh, chat here. Perfect. So hopefully everybody on Facebook can see it too. Us. Yeah, if it allows us, we'll see. Okay. Yes. So when I first put $100 into Bitcoin, I went to Coinbase. That's the website I used to do it. And I put it in. And at that time, three years ago, Amazon, there was a rumor that Amazon during their annual meeting were, were, were about to step up and actually say, we're making it official. We are going to accept Bitcoin. So I thought, wow, if I'm going to get into this, now's the time. Because Amazon, Jeff Bezos should send me a thank you card, actually, for how much money I spend on Amazon every year. I expect you and my wife both. Day. Yeah. <laughs> like, I buy everything from Amazon. If Amazon figured out how to sell cars, I'd probably buy a car from Amazon. Like, so this is so convenient. And they know everything I want. However... They chose not to do so during that meeting. It was very disappointing. Do you have any insights as to why they chose not to do so? I have a guess. Yeah, what's your guess? My guess is that they were pressured by the U.S. government and maybe people from Treasury, maybe people from um, Congress to not do that. Because, again, if let's say all major retailers on Earth accept Bitcoin, why do they even need to accept U.S. dollars at that point? 
Well, because one could make the argument that just because they accept Bitcoin doesn't mean that every single U.S. citizen is now going to just use Bitcoin for all their transactions. It'd be like oh, I agree. another option. I agree. But that's the fear of the U.S. Ah. government. So that would be my thought as to why they stepped away from that decision. They were probably pressured to, would be my guess. Okay. That's a good word that you use there, fear. Let's get into some of the fear. So one of the fears that I have heard from the U.S. government itself is that because we can't track it, we don't trust it. The fear tends to be, well, U.S. government, why do you want to track my money? It's none of your damn business. And the and, and you probably want to track it because you just want to charge me more taxes on it anyway. Are any of these statements fear or are they actually concerns that could be true? Both. Okay. All of them. Okay. All right. Both. Yeah, yeah. seriously. Um, the reason, because I've seen this off and on for the last couple of years, is I think it's senators and Congress people from both sides of the aisle. Um, um, critical, thinking, critical thinking had another comment. You might want to check out Odyssey and use YouTube as a messenger service to alert followers to draw live stream or post. YouTube, YouTube is going south. I will check that out. I don't. I've never heard of Odyssey. Yeah, um, uh, make a note of that. Let's both check it out. Yeah, Thanks. I'll actually. Yeah, thank you for that. O d y s e. Okay. okay. Yeah, we'll definitely Got it that. in my other channel. Um, so you are correct. Okay. The reason that that's correct and it's fear and it's true is because I've seen senators, Congress people in the US and frankly worldwide, I've seen this worldwide, is they can't track the money. So they're worried that a lot of fraud is happening with that. And then they prove out they prove out these stats that they show a lot of fraud is happening. What is the fraud that's happening that they allege is happening? People are transacting and stuff and they're not paying taxes, which directly mm -hmm. affects the governments and again that's another fear that they have is that people are going to do these transactions not pay taxes on them like they do let's say you go to walmart or something you have to pay sales tax that goes to a uh, sales tax in florida i think is seven percent on transactions and it goes to things like funding schools uh firemen police um stuff like at least that's where it's supposed to go i don't know where it actually goes Okay, but Jason, I'm sorry to step on you here, but I don't want to forget this. So isn't it up to the vendor, though, to collect the taxes? Like, if they're accepting Bitcoin as a transaction, wouldn't it be on them to add the tax rate to that price? Yes, it would be. But because the U.S. government and governments worldwide cannot track those because they don't have access to the database, they don't have access to the direct names, mm -hmm. they couldn't go after somebody, for example, who was a tax fraud and didn't pay their taxes because they wouldn't have the direct name of the right. person who bought. Let's okay. say they, let's say they bought a uh, Lamborghini, paid a million dollars for a Lamborghini. They will, the government would want their taxes on that. And they couldn't track that because they wouldn't have the identity. They'd have the, um, what is the, the pin number or the number, the ID VIN, number. VIN um, number. Yeah. yeah VIN number. Um, for the um, transaction. Okay. And then another tax question. If I were to take money out of Bitcoin, I haven't done it. I just, I leave it in there. It was only a hundred bucks and now it's up to 400, 500. I don't even know what it is today. All right. But if I were to take it back out, do I have to pay income taxes on that? You're supposed to. Yes. Um, I think there are some limits on the transaction size, but to my knowledge, again, I'm not a tax expert. If you've owned an, any asset for less than one year, you pay a what's called a short terms capital gains tax if you have a gain on it. Okay. If you've owned it for longer than a year, you pay what's called a long term capital gain tax, and that's typically lower. I think it's short term capital gains tax, something like thirty percent now, and it's the long term is fifteen percent. I think, but it keeps changing all the time. Um, so you pay a lower tax rate, but you still, again, technically should pay a pay taxes on it if it's over a certain amount. I think it has to be over a certain amount to pay tax on. It. Okay, and say it was over that certain amount, but I don't take it out yet. It's just sitting in Coinbase. It's just sitting there as cryptocurrency. I don't owe taxes on it at that point. It's only when I actually transact it, right? Only when I actually convert it and pull it out. I think as soon as you sell it. Okay. That next okay. year or whatever, you're supposed to pay, pay taxes on it. Again, if it's over a certain amount. Okay, that's going to bring me to a whole other slew of questions. Let's make sure we don't have any new comments. Uh, because this, I, I get a me. lot of curiosity about cryptocurrency because I'm thinking about putting more money into it, to be honest with you. I just really want to talk through this. So when I sell, 
then of course it'll be if it's a certain amount if it's capital gains thing then i'll have to pay the taxes on that okay mm -hmm. i get that now what if i i i no here's my question this might get a little complicated i've already paid taxes on this us money that i put into cryptocurrency i got it somehow i either got it through my business or i got it through somebody gave it to me but in theory though i pay taxes on this money so how can i be taxed again that is a fantastic question that I do not have an answer to. Okay, fair enough. Um, totally fair. Because it's the same thing. Like, let's say you took that hundred dollars and you bought a stock. Right. You've held it for however long you've held it, and you sell that stock, and it's a long-term capital gains tax. You already paid money on the front end on the money that you earned. Then you have to pay again when you sell, and you have a gain. So it's the same thing. Mm. Okay, so something's never changed. Taxes are taxes. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Death and taxes. Death, Death and taxes are, are the only truth. Taxes. Uh, what, what is the saying? The death and taxes are, are the only certainties in life. That's correct. That's what the thing is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So I, I actually, I didn't like what I was seeing when Bitcoin was going down. I'm sure anyone that invests in the stock market can relate to this. So I don't like when the stocks go down either, but I like it when they go up, you know, it, as long as I want to sell, would you recommend that I start putting more significant amounts of money into Bitcoin? When I say significant, I mean, I'm looking at, how can I invest $5,000 a year into Bitcoin and should I do so? So I do not personally invest in Bitcoin or other, any other cryptocurrencies. Why? Okay. I get that question all the time. I understand this stuff. Um, now I understand this stuff. Frankly, I'm fascinated by this stuff. I find it personally interesting, but I don't invest in it. Why? Because I can't value it. Because I Because it doesn't produce cash flows. For me to value something, it has to produce cash flows. So for this reason, I don't invest in Bitcoin for the same reason I don't invest in gold and silver because I can't value them. Okay. What does that mean? Bitcoin could be worth $1 million. It could be worth a million dollars or one, right. $1. It could, or it could be worth a million dollars. I don't know. Right. So am I buying, let's say, and again, I don't know what the price is today, uh, 40,000 US dollars per Bitcoin. Is that a good price? I right. don't know. Okay. Is it overvalued? Is it undervalued? I don't know. And if I can't tell those things, I personally don't invest in them. Um, however, what I do say to people is if you want to invest in Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, these kind of things, um, make sure you invest only what you are 100% comfortable or only what you are comfortable losing 100% of. Okay. Meaning if, if you invest $1,000 into it, you're not going to get kicked out of your house right? because you lost that investment. Okay. Whether that's $1,000, whether that's $50,000, whatever it is. Um, I view these as of right now as more of a speculation, um, which is fine if you want to speculate, but you need to be comfortable with that risk of losing potentially all of your money. Again, the reason it's more of a speculation to me than an investment is because Bitcoin, it goes up and down, not based off of real world fundamentals, like companies do, like stocks do, like uh, commercial real estate, like that stuff do. And yes, those can be emotional, which is happening right now in the stock market, I know. Sure. But in general, over the long term, stuff like that goes up and down based on the fundamentals of the underlying asset, the profits, cash flows going up or down. But Bitcoin, you can't track that. So everything is based off emotion and speculation. And what happened in the news today with Bitcoin is Bitcoin being, being banned in another country? Is it being... Um, used as a currency, I think was El Salvador uh, is accepting Bitcoin. It's, it's, it's all based on emotion. It's not based on the underlying fundamentals. Uh, for the most part, there are fundamentals, but they're kind of vague. Um, so that's why I don't invest in Bitcoin personally. Okay. Let's talk about banning and go through what exactly that means. So my understanding is that when a country bans Bitcoin, what that guarantees is that vendors and businesses are prohibited from accepting Bitcoin as a, um, as a currency. So therefore, Legally prohibited, yes. Okay. So, but it, <laughs> but if you're savvy enough, you can go on. You can use proxy. You can buy Bitcoin. You can you can do that. But what it means, I think, is that you are then forced to do business outside of that country. You have to go to other countries that are actually accepting that. So basically, we're talking about I mean, maybe talking about tangible objects, but we're talking about the purchasing itself needs to be done outside of that country somehow, probably through electronic means. Is that what you mean? Yeah, or on the black market, something like that. This black this market, was okay. uh, what was happening with in Venezuela. 
mm-hmm. they they um they when they started what was this three four years ago now that's crazy to think about yeah um uh, but when they were having their issues and they first started kind of their economic collapse right i think they banned us dollars because us dollars are transaction transacted a lot down there right like it is in a lot of south american countries um they banned them to stabilize their currency. So what a lot of people did that had U.S. dollars is they did it in the black market. Um, they transacted in the black market in U.S. dollars. Because uh, our U.S. dollar was still worth more than their currency, I think. Yes. Okay. Yes. It perceived as to have more value. Yes. Got it. Got it. Okay. Yes. Because they're dealing with hyperinflation and the currency going away and all the crap. That- uh, back to that perception. And you're right. I have to get yeah. ahead on that. Perceived value and actual value are not the yes. same thing either. Okay. Correct. Okay. Yeah, so that, I, I mean, I can guarantee, especially with the internet, like you said, if people are savvy enough, you can figure out how to do just about anything you want online. Um, right. So I guarantee, for example, in India, people are still transacting in Bitcoin and these other cryptocurrencies, but it's not legally allowed. It's just done, done on the black market. Okay. And it definitely, when they ban cryptocurrency, it most certainly one could say it, it harms the uh, advancement of cryptocurrency itself. I mean, if, if, if countries are banning it, well, then makes, it makes it difficult for other people to accept it. So banning, yeah. if you're a crypto fan and you want to transact with cryptocurrency, banning is bad. <laughs> it's not going to help the efforts at all, right? <laughs> yes, but I don't think it will slow it down completely. Okay. Uh, I honestly don't. Even if every country on earth uh, banned Bitcoin right now today, would it slow it down dramatically? Yes, but do I think the technology and the um, want of people to get into a different currency other than, for example, US dollars, I don't think that would stop anything, especially with the internet. Okay. All right, let's talk about another argument here, a a slightly different side. What if somebody says, look, I actually, I don't mind paying taxes. I am a person that, that really does want to pay taxes. I think that with them being involved in our schools and our roads and everything we use taxes for, this is a good thing. It helps our neighborhoods and it helps our maintenance. Um, And even income tax, I don't mind paying that. I don't know who says that, but somebody might say that. All right. So what if they say that and they say the U.S. government does have a point. They should be able to track these currencies. They should actually have a hand in it because taxes should be protected. They're actually here to help people and and fund all of our services that we have come to know and enjoy. So cryptocurrency would harm that. What would you say to that? That's a good question. I would say that in the US, and we are one of the weirdo outlier countries when it comes to this, our taxes are taken out, and again, I don't know if this is worldwide, but for this example, I know our taxes are taken out when we earn the money. So we don't even see the money. It It depends on what state you live in too. Yeah, it depends on the state. Yep. (laughs) But in general, and I don't remember what the exact study said, uh, but I remember seeing a study years ago that the U.S. is one of the only countries on earth that has mandatory taxes where most people, like I think it was like 90% of people in the U.S. pay their taxes. Yeah. And most other countries that have compulsory tax rates, people kind of do it begrudgingly or it's like a low rate or they do it stuff in the black market. It was some insane stat. So in the U.S., with that in mind, I don't think it would change much because – most people would still pay their taxes because the IRS is probably historically the most powerful policing agency in the United States. Got Al Capone, got, got all these other people on things like tax fraud. Some of us like to refer to the IRS in the United States as legalized mob because that's exactly how effective they are. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) They in the U S you don't mess with them. So I don't think in the U S it would matter much. Other places where tax rates or where taxes are compulsory, but people don't like paying taxes. Um, I think it's a bigger problem. Um, how do I mean that? Because if, again, let's say 50% of all the population in a certain country is using Bitcoin and they don't want to pay taxes on it and they choose not to pay taxes on it and they can figure out how to do that without getting caught. Right. That could lead to problems for the government, which could lead to road issues and schools and, hospitals and all that stuff again depending on the location but that's a lot of coulds as well and these these are the these are the points that that i think it is important to review you know when you when you speak to somebody about us irs 
uh, and taxes and how taxes are spent and tax dollars, et cetera. We're both aware that those kind of conversations can be dangerous at best because it just depends on the social yeah. <laughs> issues that this person is attached to. But one of the arguments is, look, these programs are good programs. It's a problem to the U.S. government because we actually want to fund these programs. On the other side, people say, well, they look at the U.S. government as, air quotes, a big, bad, evil entity. They're not actually referring to one individual that is just out to get us. They're referring to, I do not trust my government at all. I do not want them involved in anything. In fact, I want as little government as possible. And if cryptocurrency is going to help me with that, then sign me up because F, the U.S. government. So you see there's such extremes on both sides, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I understand. And I actually see, I understand both sides of the argument. Um, and I think, I think I was going to say, I was going to reiterate it, but I think you said it well there is that on one side, people trust the government. They think it's doing great things. On the other side, they don't think the government's doing great things and they don't want the government to tax them. Um, so I see both sides of the argument um, and I understand both sides of the argument to a degree. Um, but yeah, I mean, eventually it could affect tax rates, which could affect things like policing and stuff like that. But then the argument is maybe they should spend the money better now and that wouldn't be a problem. Maybe people would want to pay their taxes more. So right. again, yep. both sides Fair. of the argument. Okay, so this next question is a bit unfair to you because I know that you don't like predicting, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Do you predict that cryptocurrency itself, just the topic, is soon to become another social issue? Everything becomes a social issue eventually, doesn't it? <laughs> Especially in the U.S. lately. Everything Yeah, does. lately. Sure. Lately. Um, yeah, it seems like, seriously, it seems like everything does. It seems like it'll be another flashpoint of... Again, everything has become politics lately in the U.S. If you're not from the U.S., everything lately is becoming social. Everything, everything is becoming political. Literally everything, even sports. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and so I would assume that this is going to become political at some point, if it hasn't already to a large degree. It's kind of going to become social. It's going to become bleh. All right. I have a follow-up question here. Before I do that, let's check comments. And also, why don't you take a second, if you don't mind, and drop the Masterclass link into YouTube where they actually allow us to post it. The reason that we are having Speaking. these lives, and these will continue going, is first, I'm learning so much from Jason, and I'm taking advantage of this because he is a great teacher. He does have a Masterclass that will teach you step-by-step step how to do and know everything he knows about where to invest your money, how to invest your money. He's not the kind of financial investor that will just take it and do it and lose you money and then say, well, I told you there was a risk. He actually wants to empower you to have the information for yourself. And then once you go through that class, if you decide you actually do want him to manage your funds, but you understand exactly what he's doing and how, this this will lead you to working with him directly if you should choose to do so. That's why we're doing these lives. Jason's name is getting out there more and more because people need to hear his message. Oh, I thought it was gonna work. It worked on YouTube. The link uh, is on YouTube. Facebook blocked it. Uh, 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 all right, we'll figure that out for the next set. Any comments? Did we miss anything? Nope, nothing yet. If you all guys right. have any comments, let us know. I think we're getting somewhat towards the end. So if you have questions about No, anything, we got another hour. Know. We got another oh, hour. Oh, another hour. We're going yep. another hour today. Okay, yep. awesome. Yep, because we have two hours scheduled. All Love right, it. so 10, 11, 12. Oh yeah, we are, at, well, do you wanna go over? Cause this was interesting, you're right. We are we are towards the end, but we wanna hang out for another hour, you good? Yeah, I'm good. All right, perfect. So the reason I asked about the social, situ uh, the social issue is because I thought about the business owner who decides to collect crypto. Well, if this crypto becomes a social issue, I wonder, just speculating, could that position that business and being looked at and in a negative way from some people and a positive in the other that business could be making an innocent decision to accept cryptocurrency and then unwittingly get into a political problem what do you think to that oh, yeah. am i being paranoid here no this could definitely happen again let's let's say you live in india and you had a million dollars in bitcoin but it's now banned yeah. what are you gonna do with it yeah same thing could happen in the us i don't expect it to but it could happen in the us um, if you have, and this, this is another problem I have with individual cryptocurrencies, again, not the technology, the individual cryptocurrencies, we're talking about Bitcoin, Ethereum, um, Dogecoin, all that stuff. Let's say you have a million dollars of Bitcoin, 
but you want somebody only accepts Dogecoin. Ah, uh, yeah. What are you going right, to do there? Because it's tied to values or whatnot, whatever. <laughs> yes. So, so yes, I, I, it could, it could definitely happen. It's plausible. Um, it's definitely not a paranoia thing. It's definitely in within the realm of possibility that that could happen. Okay. All right. So I am looking at the time. I was correct the first time. We actually have time. We have another hour scheduled due to my coming in from off the road. My timing and days are all screwed up. So we are on track, actually. Look at us. We are on track. Perfect. We're good to go. So let's wrap up crypto and then get into MST, M NFTs. So for crypto, here's what I'm hearing from you. Educate yourself if you're going to invest in it. Don't look at it as an investment. Look at it as more of a skeptical thing. Uh, speculation, you said. Yes, speculation. speculation. I kind of akin that to if you want to dabble, dabble, but be willing yeah. to lose the money. Sort of like going yeah. to a casino, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. All right. Um, I'm also hearing you say it's not, in your opinion, a viable investment if you actually want to take that money seriously. Crypto is not the way to go right now, right? In my opinion, no, because I can't value it. Yes. Okay. And the other thing that I'm hearing you say is that as you're dabbling, just know you cannot quantify the value. There's no way to do that right now. It just doesn't exist right now. Now, unless Correct. until we get more global adaptation of cryptocurrencies, I feel like you would then be willing to come and reassess, but you're not there yet. Is that correct? Yes. And um, yes, I'm sure some people will either be watching this now or the replays and say you can value Bitcoin and stuff like that. I know you can to a degree, um, but I've personally talked with people who are specialists in, in this industry now. And they say it's incredibly difficult to near impossible to value stuff. And these are people that I trust enormously and respect enormously. Um, so that's another reason why I view it more as a speculation um, than a long-term okay. investment in, in my terminology, the way I look at investments. Hey, totally side question. I swear I'll move on. Has Warren Buffett commented on crypto yet? Uh, yes, he has. What is his opinion? Him and his right-hand man, Charlie Munger. They've built Berkshire Hathaway from, well, Buffett built it from $100,000 investment to, at last check, it was like $500 billion company. Yeah. They both hate it. <laughs> okay. Charlie Munger has a specifically strong take on it. And I don't remember the exact quote, but he said something along the lines of it's worthless and dangerous. Uh, I don't take it that far because, again, to me, it's like any other speculation. Right. Um, which I don't invest in anyways um so because i because i see them as dangerous um but the reason the reasons they don't like it that much is for the reasons i've outlined you can't value it um all the other stuff that we talked about but charlie munger's biggest problem with it to my knowledge is he views it as a complete speculation like any of the big speculations of the last hundred hundred or so years the um stuff that was going on during the great depression the housing stuff in 2007 he views it as that kind of level of craziness that's going on so that's another reason he he thinks it's going to hurt a lot of people okay makes sense all right so here is my conclusion for myself i am i've decided that i don't need any more junk from amazon so i'm going to chuck a hundred dollars a month into bitcoin and just do that periodically just, i mean a hundred dollars for me i can spend more than that on amazon anyway and it will reduce the junk that i have and it might make me a little bit more money if i'm just dabbling i think that's what i'll do do you feel like i know that it's hard for you to answer this but you feel like that's a common sense approach maybe yeah i do um and actually that's that's not out of the realm of um how did you word it that's not um outside of common sense yeah to me just like with gold and silver and I, I'd want cryptocurrencies in the same category. If you have five to 15% of your thing, of your investment portfolio in those things, that makes sense to me yeah. because you want to be diversified. You want to have other assets in case the US dollar crashes because of all the debt, all that stuff. That, that makes sense to me. If you have like 50 to 75% of your portfolio in these things, that's scary. That's scary. Okay. That <laughs> because of the sense. huge fluctuations that are going on. And again, the lack of valuing it, the potential of bans, all the uncertainties that are going on that we already talked about. Well, we'll tell you when I saw it going down and down, if I had significant money in there, I wouldn't, I, I would have thrown up multiple times and I would have, oh, yeah. yeah, that, that would have been way too risky. So I get it. I get it. Okay. Perfect. That, oh, that, that, that gets me to another point. I'm glad you said that. Yeah. Is only invest in anything, whether it's a speculation or a long-term investment like I do with money, you can afford to lose anytime Fair. you invest anything. 
Okay. So you should never be kicked out of your house because you lost an investment, um, stuff like that. It should only only be what you're comfortable losing. Which is why your masterclass covers this stuff, how to prevent that kind of Correct. thing from happening. All right, perfect. All right, now switching topics, kind of, because it's still digital. Yes. Let's talk about NFTs. Now, let me open this up in this way. At first, when I heard about NFTs, I heard about them through Gary Vaynerchuk. I was turned off immediately. And the reason for that is Gary Vaynerchuk is a marketer that I respected for quite a while. I actually watched, I liked where he came from and doing his wine stuff on YouTube. I'm a big wino, so I appreciate that kind of thing. I like that he was then able to build a marketing business and he's really smart and he's still really smart about what he does. Over time though, he transitioned from that to really kind of marketing more towards the younger crowd um, and the language and the energy in which he's using that turned me off because I no longer was a target audience. So I have no personal beef against very Gary V uh, because he's, you know, he's got his niche. So therefore when he mentioned NFT, my mind immediately disassociated it with, I am not going to be interested in that because I am not his target audience. So I ignored it. Then I saw a thing recently, an article that came across one of the business uh, news feeds that I look at. And it turns out that these NFTs are actually a subject of massive amounts of fraud at the moment, which of course is ugly. And that's why it caught my attention. So now I'm looking because it's like a bad car accident. So I'm looking at this and it looks like it's all over YouTube. There are some people that are like creating fake NFTs or something and selling them or say they sold them. I don't really understand anything more than that. So let's start from the beginning. That's my knowledge. What is an NFT? Let's start there. NFT stands for non-fungible fungible token. Um, I don't know why they picked that name. <laughs> yeah, right. That um, is, that's like yeah, fungus. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why they picked that name. But <laughs> the way I like to think about NFTs is it's um, back when me and my brother were kids, we we bought and sold and traded um, uh, like fo baseball and football cards. Oh, yeah. Okay. To me, that's what like an N NFT is. That or a piece of art. Well, shit, my uh, husband what? has a metric shit ton of baseball cards. I'm tracking this. Yeah. Thing. Okay. Yeah. So to me, that's what it's like because you have an asset that – maybe only a thousand people, for example, can have worldwide. And then you can buy, sell, or trade that with other people for other okay. stuff. Now, this is a digital asset, though. I don't make that clear. Yes, my this is a digital it. asset, though. Correct. Okay, what is it's it? It's not is a it physical picture? trading. Is it like a picture or something? So it can be pictures, can be um, drawings, can be, um, I think there's even music out there. Um, there are NFTs. Uh, but I think most of it so far is are things like pictures, graphics, um, stuff like that. Okay. Who creates these things? Anybody. So Coke um, actually created their first NFTs last week, the week before, and they're raising money, all, all money from proceeds of the NFTs. We're going to go to um, help the Special Olympics. Um, cool. Yeah. So these can be anything. And they, they had several different, I think there were four different ones. And one of them was a they the way they worded it is a reimagining of a 1950s era one of their most iconic um vending machines from the 1950s era is a reimagining of a picture of that oh okay i like that i like that in theory yeah so they sold that they raised money and they sent it to the special olympics uh, so um musicians are doing this kind of stuff sports teams are starting to do this kind of stuff um so another example for the sports people out there, Sports Illustrated has done these uh, for probably decades now, these special issues like when your team wins the Super Bowl in the NFL, special issue all about your team and how they won the Super Bowl, stuff like that. Instead of that going out in a physical like magazine style format, that can be sold, for example, in an NFT as an example um, to say 10,000 people. Okay, that brings me to the next question. These are limited. How do you limit them and who can prove that they're actually limited? How do you how do you prove that? So I can tell that is a toast on the blockchain if they are done through a legitimate outlet. Okay. So what's happening now with a lot of people is they see NFTs and they go buy 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 something without doing the research. So they get taken advantage of. And because people aren't really selling true NFTs, they're selling just some, something they probably just made up. Uh, Real okay. NFTs will be hosted on the blockchain by a reputable source um, so you can track if this is real or not. And again, like with any kind of investment ever, you need to do your research. Um, so that's that. What was, what was the first question again? Sorry. That was, that was how to uh, limit it. Now, how can we prove they're limited? You said they have to be through blockchain. 
So how yes. does it, how does the technology say, okay, 10,000 have sold now it's cut off. You cannot do it anymore. I don't know to my knowledge, okay. this is, and you might be able to answer this better than I can uh, because you have more of a technical background when it comes to this kind of stuff than I do or a development background than, than I do, but they make, let's say again, 1000 things. And then when those 1000 things sell out, they cannot be sold anymore. That's to my knowledge. And then they cap it on the development side of things. Again, I don't know how they do that, but. So yeah, now you're correct on that. Now from the technology background, I can't speak to how they sell this because I'm just learning, but here's my problem with it. I suppose it comes down to me just poking holes. Where are the vulnerabilities? You know, I can, as I can use developers to, to block it, you know, after a certain amount of sales, but then if I was, you know, had nefarious intentions, I could simply fire it up somewhere else and then do the same amount of blocking. Like I, I really could just duplicate this digital asset as many times as I want. So I suppose that might be answering my own question here. How is it, how can we prove it's limited? I suppose we have to look at the honesty and integrity of the company that we're doing business with, which is, I think what you're saying, do the research. Yeah. Right? yeah. Okay. And I mean, is this like a piece of art? How do you know, unless you're a high level art connoisseur, how do you know you're getting a real Leonardo right, Vinci or a knockoff or are you getting a knockoff? Yeah. Okay. Trust right. and verification, authentication, all that stuff. How is that going to work in the digital space for a digital asset that you have only one of these thousand things and it wasn't a reproduction? I have no idea how they're going to do that, especially for things like pictures. I mean, I right. honestly don't understand how they're going to do that with pictures. Okay. All right. So that's the first problem with NFTs then. We don't really know how it can be limited or, or not fraudy, but yeah. we're going to look at, we're going to look at reputable uh, brokers for this. We're going to start there. We're going to do our homework. Okay. Do our homework. What does that mean? What are we going to look at? Um, make sure you're signed up on the blockchain, whatever platform you use properly. Make sure they're using blockchain. Um, like Coinbase, like I'm using? Yeah, whatever, whatever your preference okay. is. Uh, Coinbase is, I think, probably the biggest one. Yeah. Um, something like that. Make sure they that you trust whoever you're using the platform that you're using. Um, how do you do that? Reviews, experience, um, all that stuff. Google rankings. Uh, I would view this kind of as a like a Google review thing. Like when you're going to look at a restaurant, do they have a ton of reviews? If they do, let's say they have hundreds of reviews and another, and if they have a four and a half star rating, but another company has say a dozen reviews and they have a four and a half star rating. Most people are mo more likely to go to the one that has hundreds of reviews versus 12. Yes. So it's I'm probably, wondering. it's, it's, I would imagine it's probably something very similar to that. Okay. All right. Now, what are, why would somebody even want to buy an NFT? That's a good question. Um, why would anybody want to buy art? Why would anybody want to buy a sports team? Yeah. Um, okay. Cause I, I, why would anybody want to buy trading cards? Um, baseball, football, basketball cards, Pokemon cards, whatever your thing was. Um, because it gives them some form of entertainment, um, especially for art. They like looking at it. They think it'll go up in value. This gets us to, um, cause I want the reason I sell all these things together, sports teams, all that stuff. I appear to be frozen. There we are. Uh, yeah, I can see you. Okay. Yeah, you're good. Um, I I lump things like sport teams, um, art, uh, NFTs, trading cards into kind of all the same category. And what comes into play here is what's called the greater fool theory. This is not to be derogatory. This is the actual name of the theory. Sure. Um, you buy, let's say, a sports team. Why do anybody want to buy a sports team? Other than the prestige. <laughs> yeah, other than the prestige. Because they think it's going to go up in value. So that's the same reason people buy NFTs if they know what they're doing and actually doing it intentionally. Maybe they just like to trade stuff too. Like me and my brother, we would act like we were doing stuff, but looking back, we were just kind of trading and having fun with them. Yeah. Um, so there's part of it. The bigger part for most people um, is that the prestige, it's brand new, and then that ticket's going to go up in value. Um, same thing with sports teams. I mean, same things with, with pieces of art. You think they're going to go up in value over time or you derive some form of entertainment out of it. Okay. So this is more like along the lines of then they may want to sell it. They may want to keep it. They may just want to be one of the only ones that have a limited number of this thing. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of like an elite club. And then we yeah. all like that. You know, we all like being part oh, yeah. of that. Okay. So this then, I think I already know your answer. This then is not what you would consider a viable investment. Is that For true? me and my preferences, that is correct. No, I would okay. not. Um, and why is that? Again, because 
track value on these though, Jason. You said one of your rules is you have to be able to track the value. Yes, but you're tracking the price there though. Shit, I did it again, didn't I? I did it again. <laughs> okay. So let's say you have a Leonardo da Vinci painting and you buy it for a hundred thousand dollars. Okay. That's the price and that's the value you put on it. If you can sell it for five hundred thousand dollars, right? What if you would you sell it for that? If you value it at lower than five hundred thousand dollars with value, you probably would. Oh uh, yeah. If you I, value yeah. it at five million dollars and you just love the piece, you probably wouldn't. Oh no, I'd still sell it, but I get your point. Yeah, I get your point. So, yeah, so there. Okay. That, yeah. To, and, and the main reason is well, there's a lot of reasons, but um, because you can't put a value on it, in my opinion, at this stage, other than the emotional value of something. Again, go back to the painting. If you have an emotional attachment to that, you probably won't sell for just about any price. If you sure. don't, and you're just looking at it for investment, you probably sell for whatever, um, as long as you can make a return on it. So that depends. Um, they also don't produce cash flows. That's another reason. And that's another reason you can't put the, the value on it is because it doesn't produce cash flows it's based off of people's emotions. Um, the fraud stuff and there's a bubble building in NFTs. And so all these things kind of combined, I haven't bought any NFTs yet. Okay. I'm sure it was something. You know, what you just made me think about is I recently over the summer hosted a party at my home and there was a gentleman here from Jersey. He is a huge Yankee fan. I mean, massive New York Yankees fan. And he had a client at one point that he became very close with. They became like brothers. The client unfortunately passed away. Now in the will, the client willed this gentleman uh, four or six, I can't remember what it is, original seats from the original Yankee Stadium, the first built Yankee Stadium, four or six of them, I can't remember how many they were. And it had even the plaque along with them, the whole track, like this is a thing. And I said, oh my God, you could probably get a severe amount of money for that. And he said, it is not only not for sale, but I wouldn't part with this for all the money in the world. And I looked at him and I went, you realize you could pay off anything you wanted and completely change your lifestyle. And he said, no, not worth it. So I think that's what you made me think of. Maybe these NFTs are kind of the same thing. Now to me, it's absurd, but I don't love it that much. He wouldn't change it. So maybe that's what you're trying to say, right? Yes, no, exactly. And there's something that I'm sure you would like and you would you would pay you you can get paid enough in the world to either give up or oh get. shit you know what <laughs> you're right you know what just came to my mind without thinking about that is Lars's original guitar no oh, Hatfield. Metallica Hatfield. Hatfield. yeah Hatfield's original guitar yeah okay I'm with you now I'm trying exactly so yeah. you could think of that as an NFT it's that the NF that's an actual real thing you can hang on your wall which I guess mm -hmm. the NFTs you can if you print them out sure um, but that's a physical object where NFTs are digital, but it's the same thing, same concept essentially. Okay, fair enough. But a side note, I would also accept Lars's drums just so that we're clear for the record here. So, <laughs> okay, so this is not an investment. This is a play area. Um, so what if I wanted to play? What are, if you know, where are some places I can go and just kind of look at what's available? I don't know, honestly. Okay, um, I haven't looked um, because I, I purposely haven't looked. Yeah even though I know a lot about this stuff and DeFi and cryptocurrencies and all that, because I don't want to see something that I want. <laughs> right. And then I'm like, Ooh, I want that. Well, now why so, not though? That's my question here. I mean, we're talking about playing. Does it make you uncomfortable to play in a digital world? Is that what's going on? No. See, I don't, I, I'm a lifetime video gamer. So playing in a digital world doesn't bug me. The thing that bugs me is spending money on stuff. Ah. That's what I don't like. Okay. I, the only, Legitimately, the only time I spend money on anything for me or my family personally is experiences. I'm an experience guy, like um, vacations, going out to dinner, going to events, stuff like that. That's for my family. The only thing I buy for myself personally, other than like food, right, is books and courses and stuff to improve myself. So, so basically, you're a boring old man that doesn't like to have any fun at all. My wife would probably agree with that. <laughs> we know that's not true. That is not true. That was, that My wife would probably agree with that, though. Yeah, for anyone watching, that was a shot. I know it, but Jason's a very good friend of mine, so he knows I do not mean that. <laughs> oh, yeah. that uh, we missed any comments. Let's take a look. Um, I do not see any. If you guys have any comments, let us know. If you're on Facebook, make sure to check out the YouTube so we can actually see your comment because we can't see them on Facebook for whatever reason. Okay, perfect. 
Now, let's talk about the negative side of MST, NFTs and going a little deeper. On the YouTube channels that I was finding, these uh, actually one of the channels in particular specializes in tracking down fraud. And mm -hmm. what? And he's a younger kid. He's in his 20s. I won't give his name out here because I don't want to direct traffic there. We want traffic to stay here. Uh, but uh, what he does is he direct he he looks at fraud and he's saying that there are people out there coming up with fake NFTs and selling them, getting the money, and then disappearing. Oh. How does that happen? I don't understand how you can sell a fake NFT if you're supposed to. Oh, is it because of blockchain? Because people aren't doing the research. Ah. And they aren't being tracked on the blockchain. These fake NFTs are probably not on the blockchain at all. They're probably not even real. Um, this goes back. This has been happening forever. Um, bit best example I can think of is snake oil salesman back in the was it eighteen hundreds? Yeah, early 1800s. People were people were in pain. They wanted to fix an issue, and they were willing to try literally anything to fix their issue. So people would buy them, or they would buy from these less than trustworthy salesmen. They were desperate. <laughs> and, yeah, because they were desperate. Now, that's not necessarily the case in NFTs, True. but there is probably a desperation if if you care about this stuff and you all your friends are getting NFTs and you want to get an NFT, but you don't necessarily know where to go. You want to get on it because it's cool or whatever the reason is, and you don't do your research, and then you just buy from some rando on the internet. Just okay. a modern-day version of snake oil salesman to me. Got it. Okay, so we have time here and I'm excited that we do. We're gonna utilize this time. Let's now switch and we're about to see how good Jason is because he has no idea where even, we didn't even review this. But I trust Jason, you can handle this. Let's talk about meme stocks. What yes. in the heck, because I feel like it's in the same kind of family here, but tell me if I'm wrong. What in the heck is a meme stock? They're kind of in the same family, a little bit to a degree. Okay, <laughs> uh, meme stock. Okay. Um, a meme stock is, something like GameStop, AMC, um, other stocks that were going up based on what was happening on Reddit and other internet sites with people essentially getting together and saying they're going to push this stock up through the moon or whatever the saying was. <laughs> um, that's what a meme stock is. It's it's driven largely by people on the internet, um, specifically on, on groups like... Um, Wall Street bets on Reddit specifically. Okay, so we know memes itself are all internet drived and people yes. create them and, and they're supposed to be fun. Tesla fun to the moon and crazy. critical yeah. thinking. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yes. <laughs> okay, so that's that's where meme stock comes in. So does that does yes. that mean I'm supposed to interpret it as a I suppose a less than serious stock option or or I should just know for me if it's a meme stock it might mean the serious money is not really taking it that seriously. Is that correct? I would say that's fair to a degree. Um, some of these meme stocks actually, and I don't know the stories behind them, but some about chicken tendies and stuff like that. Critical thinking, you might have some thoughts on that. I don't know. Um, some about chicken tendies and some of the other stocks, they actually have stories behind them, which came from a meme, which is why they get the name meme stock. Another reason they get uh -huh. the name meme stock. Um, I don't know the full stories and transparency. I don't because okay. <laughs> I'm yeah. not on those sites. Um, but I do know some of them come with stories. I don't know the to the moon thing, though. Critical thinking, if you have that, then it's going to go straight up. Be I'm curious. assuming that's what that means. Um, but would – I do not recommend investing in them. I'll just say it all right. <laughs> okay. I do not recommend investing in them. Um, why? Yeah, why? Why is that? We'll take GameStop because I've actually evaluated GameStop. GameStop, uh, this was probably last, no, this March, this February and March, when GameStop was going nuts and it went up from like $40 a share to like $400 a share or something like that. It was going up so fast and so crazily that every single day I was getting messages from people asking me if I should invest in GameStop side. From and one family, of those messages, uh, not, if I remember right, was your brother. Yes, from my that's what I was gonna say from my brother. Let's, yeah, who, let's go through what happened there. I like that. <laughs> who never has once ever shown a hint of interest in investment realm when I've been doing this for 15 years. So he was asking me about GameStop, not only because of this and to see if he could make money off it, but we grew up and we've been again lifelong gamers and we used to go into GameStops all the time. Uh, it's a terrible stock. 
Um, again, I've actually evaluated most of these people who are in on these things. They haven't even, I, I've actually evaluated them. Um, I've actually evaluated GameStop. They're unprofitable. Their business model is completely dying. Yeah. Um, and they're trying to transition their business model. And nine out of 10 companies that try to tra completely transition their business model fail to do so. Uh, Blockbuster is an example. Um, MySpace is an example to a degree. Uh, Kodak is another example. If you have to transition your entire business model, nine out of 10 times you're gonna fail. Because of that, I said, well, partly because of that was the main reason I told people not to invest in GameStop back when this was going crazy. The other reason is because if you buy on the way up and you don't get out before it crashes and it always crashes, you're going to get crushed. Got it. What you're probably alluding to, Charlene, is a story I told you is my brother asked me about, um, yeah, no, yeah. AMC and GameStop, yeah, I would. I, I think you were that perfectly critical thinking, um, but I only play with AMC and GameStop. I think that's a perfect way to put. What did what did he? How did he word it? Read it. Uh, critical thinking. I I hold the AMC, T Doc, uh, GameStop, Palantir, Apple, Beyond. Uh, I think that's Beyond Meat is a stock ticker, and of course Tesla. But I only play with AMC and GameStop. Oh, um, fair enough. And critical theory. I apologize. I assumed he. I don't know if that's correct. So yes. I meant that person. Go ahead. Jesus. Yes, critical thinking. Um, yeah, he, she, whatever you want to be called, doesn't matter. Yep, to me. we're all good. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm just glad you're here enjoying this live stream and, and interacting. I appreciate that. Um, so, if you buy when it's going up and you're not one of these people on the in the game, the GameStop, um, or not the GameStop, the um, Wall Street Insider Bets or Wall Street Bets, I think is what the name of the group was called. If you're not one of those people on the in kind of driving this, you don't know when it's going to crash, so you're going to get crushed. So when most people were asking me about GameStop, he for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Uh, I guess when you're most right. people were asking me about GameStop, it was about $100, $120 a share, if, if memory serves me right. Okay. It went up to like $300, $400 a share. And then people, so they would have bought probably like between $150, $200 a share. They would have right. seen a huge gain. Of course, when that happens, people are like, oh, blah, 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 blah. I lost all this money because. <laughs> I didn't sure. invest. <laughs> and then it crashed badly when it did crash, because again, there's always a crash in these situations. When it did crash, lost a lot of money. So I sent my brother after I saw it crash, I said I sent my brother a text because I'm a smart ass older brother. I said, You're welcome. That's all I said. You're welcome. And he said, For what? Except for helping you not lose a lot of money. <laughs> 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 so that that's those two reasons, GameStop actually being a terrible stock, um, in my opinion, and the bigger issue them not probably being able to transition, even though, again, I hope no business fail because I'm a business owner myself and I love business is and business. I don't want any businesses to fail. I don't short sell ever. If you haven't seen my other videos, I don't short sell ever, so I don't benefit off any of this. Yeah. Uh, but in my opinion, based on what I require, it's not a great stock. So helping to save people a lot of money because it's not a great stock and because if you don't know when to get out and nobody does, 100% of the time, nobody does. Not even the best traders are. Probably George Soros is probably the best trader ever. He's not great at timing the market consistently. You can do it probably every once in a while, but if you try to time the market consistently over long periods of time, you're going to lose. Um, so those two reasons I tell people not to invest in meme stocks. Okay, so would it be fair then if I were to think about that and say, well, because I understand Jason's approach to investing, if I were to invest in a, in a meme stock, I should then use the same caution and rules that I would apply to NFTs and Bitcoin. I have to yes. be willing to lose the money. Is that yeah. fair? Yeah, and that's, that's actually what I told everybody I invest or who asked me. Only invest in these stocks if you're 100%, if you're comfortable losing 100% of that money. Okay. That's what I told everybody back in, again, I think it was February, March when this was going on. Because again, I've been doing this so long that, <laughs> that people, I typically give them advice and they typically don't like it or they don't listen to it, uh, which I, I don't take personally that. anymore. <laughs> um, so I always throw in, if you are going to invest in this, because I know that they pretty much will if they're going to ask me about it. If you are going to invest in it, be comfortable losing 100% of your money. 
or be comfortable with the thought of losing 100% of your money. Has anyone ever gotten mad at you for advice that you've given? Yeah, yes. Almost every day on YouTube. <laughs> How do you work through that? I mean, you know, that never really occurred to me until just now, Jason, because we do know each other so well. And I have the benefit, like the people who work with you and go through your master class of knowing that you're trustworthy. So I, I don't get mad when you say, no, this is a bad investment. How do you handle it when people say that they are mad at you because of it? First off, I don't understand that mindset where people get mad at me for giving they ask me for my advice and i'm going to give them my advice i don't get i don't understand that right if they didn't ask me for my advice and let's say it's just uh because all the videos we do on youtube are requested by viewers right so let's say they weren't the one that requested the video but they own the stock that i talked negatively about ah now it's personal now it's personal to them which again oh. i've never understood because even though i view these as long-term holdable assets i don't have sentimental value to any stock or any company I own. Right. Um, even my own, frankly, I don't have any sentimental value, although it would suck if things kind of crash tomorrow. I don't sure. hold, I would figure something out and do something else. Okay. So I don't understand that mindset. But how do I deal with that? Um, typically, and you'll probably, this probably won't uh, surprise you, logically. Yeah, makes sense. And I say, hey, and this is this is legitimately what I've written word for word on several people, um, saying I was wrong about investment, or um, I hope you're wrong, or something like that. And I said, truly, I hope I am wrong. I uh, <laughs> I don't want any business to fail. I don't want any stock to go down. I don't short sell ever, so I don't benefit from this. I'm just going based on what I require for the investment portfolios I manage. I'm giving you my thoughts on this because this was requested by a viewer. So I do it logically. Um, how do I deal with that emotionally? It it used to bother me. It doesn't anymore. Um, I don't know if it's because of time and experience. I don't know what it is. Um, yeah. It used to really bother me because I'm a pretty likable person. <laughs> yeah, you are very approachable. Yeah. Um, and I'm, yeah, I'm very approachable. I'm very. I try to be very kind, very nice to literally everybody I talk to, even if they're rude or mean to me. Sure. Um, so I used to take it really personally. Um, I don't anymore because I realize now again. I don't know if the experience thing. I don't know what it is that people if they own something whether when well, this is whatever it is if they own anything most people get sentimentally attached to things whether that's a stock whether that's whatever it is i don't i don't know why that is um but i don't so that's another reason i get over it is this person is just we're just wired differently um and so i don't take it personally i usually actually when i see a comment like that i forward it to my team and have a smile on my face like this and um add it to our hater pile <laughs> you know what you should do you should totally create on your website a um a hater a hater wall or i have wall. done a video on youtube <laughs> about some of the haters before and this was like more serious stuff like not people just disagreeing with me like people one one person literally this was years ago when I did still take stuff personally and when I didn't know anything about online marketing. Yeah. I was marketing my own book on my own website and somebody told me to go kill myself. Oh my God. <laughs> because because I was the devil or something like that for promoting my own book on my own website. Um, I took that personally because again, that was years ago. Internet but trolls. I don't anymore. Yeah. So, but I did make a video about some of the haters we've had before. Oh, so I thought that was funny. I'll probably, <laughs> yeah, I'll probably do another one at some point. There you go. I thought that was funny. Well, Critical think thinking has up. another comment. Sorry. Oh, yes, please. Yeah, I was going to say, look at the uh, comments. I think that wraps up my questions for now. Yeah, Critical Thinking has another comment. My rule is only gamble 5 to 10% five to on meme stocks. I would say, yeah, if you're comfortable losing that money, that makes sense. Good rule. I like it. And it's a nice, modest number. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, if it was like 50, 75%. Yeah, maybe insane. we should talk. <laughs> 5 to 10%. Uh, well, here's better what better than spending now. money on random crap on the internet. <laughs> well, yes. I'm telling you. When it comes down to that, that's why I've actually lately been more interested in what can I do with sort of play investments because I'm looking at the monies that are coming out for entertainment and things that we get for a household. Yeah. You know, we really, I'm not saying it'd be smarter to invest in this stuff, but at least the chance of it making some money is better than buying a tangible item and it just sits there. But when you have a better chance of winning than going to a casino too. This is a fair point, but I'm still not going to the casino. For some reason, it's different for me. I don't know why. Couldn't tell you why. Mm, casinos. I used to go in them quite a bit. Mm. We went. We went into one. Me and my wife went to New Orleans, and I was in a casino for the first time. The Harris down in um, downtown New Orleans, and we lost like sixty bucks in twenty minutes. 
And I told my wife, I was like, this is why I don't like gambling. This is why I don't gamble anymore. <laughs> well, the pro because the problem is that business owners, we can actually calculate how much time and effort it's going to take to, to earn that money yeah. back. And then how much time and effort it'll take to actually make money on that money we lost to begin with. Yeah. Yep. But, exactly. Uh, it wasn't fun. I would rather personally spend it on food, thinking about it now. or investing. <laughs> well, it's, it's lunchtime for you. I get that. So with that in mind, I have no more questions. I do want to highlight the master class. The thing I didn't ask you today or a topic that I should a question I should have asked about these topics that you would like to have covered before we wrap. I don't I will say actually one thing. Uh you brought Gary V earlier. Yeah. I like Gary V. I don't watch his I, I went on this huge face where I was listening to him stuff non nonstop. Um and I don't as much anymore. Same here. For, Both. for similar reasons as to you. Um, but I will say if anybody is trying to hype up or sell you anything and they're not specifically in the arena, you need to be very careful. Ooh, smart advice, Jason. Because they're probably trying to sell you something. Um, and again, I'm not saying Gary Vee or I've seen Peng June talk about cryptos and NFTs. I'm not saying they're doing anything fraudulent. I am saying if you're going to listen to them for any kind of investment advice whatsoever, because they're not in the investment space, you need to be very careful. Um, Love that advice. So that is the only thing I would say um, is whoever you're watching, because a lot of people are talking about it now, watch it with a grain of salt. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. No, that's really smart. Yeah. Consider the source. Would you want to learn about brain surgery from your dentist or would you like to go to the actual brain surgeon that does it? Yeah. Well, and here, here's another example is, um, on that route is if you needed brain surgery, would you rather go to somebody who has does brain surgeries all day, every day, or somebody who just kind of plays in brain surgeries every once in a while? Yeah, <laughs> fair enough. Wow, we do it that way. <laughs> all right, fair enough. Okay, so why are we doing these lives? Let's wrap it up with this. We've got this master class. You have put together an awesome class, even for someone like me who came in to your world with zero financial investing knowledge or experience. Even I have been able to learn from these tactics that you're teaching. And you've done this on purpose. You've done this because you want to empower people like me to, to have more knowledge so that they're not running into an issue with a snake oil sales guy or a nefarious, uh, what do you call it, investor, somebody that just tries to over talk them, right? Yeah. So what is in your masterclass? What are we going to learn? So in the masterclass, um, you're going to learn how to find, evaluate, and value great stocks fast. Um, what do I mean by that? The yeah. processes that I've developed for the last 15 years and are in the course help me evaluate 3,943 stocks in 40 days. And um, <laughs> sorry, Critical Thinking has, has some great comments over here. Um, the only loyalty I have is my portfolio. Companies are for profit, and so am I. I dump after the pump with the thumbs up. That's a love great it. Point. And then, if I needed brain surgery, I would go to Elon Musk. He may be the only person <laughs> that, on earth. Yeah, <laughs> that's a pretty fair example. Pretty exception. <laughs> because he legitimately taught himself rocket science from learning from books. Yeah, pretty so, sure he could figure it out. <laughs> he's probably the lone exception on earth for that. That's a great way point. to make us look like fools. Critical <laughs> theory. Well played. <laughs> That's awesome. I love it. <laughs> um, but so you learn all of that in these processes that I used to evaluate 3,943 stocks in 40 days in 73 countries. Why is that important? Because the more stocks you are able to look at, the more, the higher chances and the higher probabilities you have of finding great stocks fast and investing in those stocks. Um, I did that back in, I evaluated the stocks in 40 days during the COVID crash last year. And if I was able to buy, I was not able to buy because the market shot up higher, faster than it's ever gone before. But if I was able to buy the stocks, seven stocks I found after researching those stocks, um, that I absolutely 100% was confident to buy for the long term, I would have been up 99.8% of the portfolios I managed last year. Um, wow. Which is very good. Yeah. <laughs> the average um, investor does about 10% per year. 
I do in the first nine years of my career about 23 and a half percent per year on average in the first nine years of my career which legitimately makes me one of the best talk pickers in the entire world over the last nine years so okay, you learn you go ahead you when you have yes. the experience so what do you mean by fast do i have to go through this course for 12 free months before i can even look at a stock no so one of our students um damien who you and i are both familiar with Charlotte, yeah we went through four one-hour training sessions together and he was able to after that from zero knowledge zero knowledge in finance other than he liked finance and business and want to learn about it to evaluating stocks by himself in four 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 one hour sessions wow okay now that's my kind of time frame actually that's a lot better so yes. if i want to get in the game now i'd rather it be now ish rather than much later ish all right so we yeah, got stocks no. what else is in your course um uh, well it's mainly a stock investing course okay, but the perfect. principles can be used to not only invest well in stocks I've adapted the principles myself to look at private businesses to buy and also commercial real estate to buy as well. So the principles are the same, the investing principles in, and what I mean by that, buying stuff when it's cheap. How do you figure out if it's cheap? By figuring out its value. This goes back to the conversation we were having earlier on price versus value. If the price is up here for a stock and I find the value is up here, that means it's overvalued. That means I wouldn't want you to buy it. However, if they're reversed, reverse I, i'm never going to get used to this camera being mirrored i know <laughs> if that's reversed and the value is up here and the price is down here that means the stock is massively undervalued that right. means i should put, consider buying it so how do i figure out that's a big thing what we talk about in the course um how to find evaluate and value stocks to figure out stocks that are undervalued so you can have a increase your odds of not only investment success but lower your downside risk and lower your risk of losing money as well. And this is a framework, you're saying this is a framework that I can then apply to real estate if I want to or anything else I want to invest in. Yeah, so I've used these these principles not only for personal investments in the portfolios I manage, but also I've gotten jobs with these skills, writing jobs, nice. investment, writing jobs. I've gotten, um, I've uh, consulted with companies um, all over the world that have been millions of worth millions of dollars um, on how to grow their businesses. Um, so you can use these skills not only to invest in stocks to multiply your money, but you can always use these skills to make money as well. Okay. And now one more question about this, and I swear we can wrap up because this is important. I've taken other courses after learning from somebody that I want to learn from, and I get in the course and it turns out I can't eat, I can't access that person. I mean, they, maybe they have somebody that will answer my question for me, but I don't want to talk to that person. I want to talk to the person I bought the course from. How much access do we have to you in this course? A lot. So especially the first, because we just relaunched this this month, wasn't it? Yep. Earlier this yep. Month. And we've we already got people this, coming in quick. Yeah. This, we relaunched this officially earlier this month. We've already got people coming in. But the first to be determined amount of people, it's going to be a small amount of people that come in, will get a ton of access to me. What do I mean by that? Group trainings one-on-one -on -one trainings potentially with me or, or actually probably for the first several people um, who keep coming in um, access to our Facebook group access to me via phone calls text zoom zoom uh, zoom calls all that you will have an enormous amount of access to me especially for the first kind of groupings of people that come in um, not only because I can help you because I've been doing this so long but I can answer your questions because I've likely struggled with a lot of the same stuff you've struggled with um, or I've had students who have struggled with the same stuff you're struggling with so I can keep your progress going fast so you don't kind of plateau, frustrate and go down and then have to figure it all out again. So if I go through this and then I, I find a stock and I think it might be a worthwhile investment based on the information I have learned in your masterclass, can I then take that stock and what I've learned to you and be like, can you have a look at this to make sure I haven't lost my mind here? Would you be able to do that? Yes, yes. so I've actually done that with students. Um, we've done that and specifically I'm thinking of right now Shafiq if you're out there <laughs> one of our students he brought a couple stocks into our group trainings and we went through them when I say we went through them we went through my entire process from beginning to end including reading their financial statements um, their financial reports going back several years we did this entire weeks long case study where we did this and we got to the end and Shafiq really liked the stock and he said we put in a, so much time in this and i was like yeah we did but i would not recommend you buy the stock because it's not a good stock in my opinion that stock 
ended up falling like 99 percent wow after we made that video because i i found some red flags in there that were um made me think they were doing things not well not properly not even legally if memory serves me right and so we backed away and i don't I actually don't know if he invested in so i'm gonna have to ask him <laughs> but yeah, I'm curious i we did do that stock and it, if again if i'm thinking about the right stock because we covered a lot of stocks if i'm thinking about the right stock it fell like 99 percent and either went into bankruptcy or got bought out or something um could because there was some there was some fraud or something going on there the worthwhile amount of time to spend on saving yourself from losing a, a substantial amount of money yes <laughs> all right fair enough all right jason i think we should wrap for the day we're going to be live again next week uh what do you think we all good perfect love all it right. looking forward to it hey uh critical theory thanks for hanging out with us critical today. thinking a pleasure critical thinking sorry thanks for <laughs> hanging out with us today you are a pleasure now i'm going to tell you this i am taking it on myself to find us a proper platform now that we're making this more official and we're getting people into this course and um, we're getting questions on the side, I will make sure that we get the tech taken care of. So this will be nice and stable and steady going forward. And you can edit this out, Jason, but fuck Facebook. Okay. We don't need it. <laughs> so, I'll probably, I'll probably leave it in there. There but. we go. All right, Jason, I'm going to head out. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Thanks, Charlene. Thanks, Critical Thinking. Thanks, everybody, showing up today. Bye, everyone.